Hi, Mr. Richards here. Today is part two in our lesson on linear functions. Our key concept is how to represent functions. We can do so in words, with an equation, ordered pairs, a table, and a graph. Now, a linear function is a function in which the graph of the solutions forms a straight line. Therefore, an equation of the form y equals mx plus b is a linear function. Now, here's something that may be new. A function can be con considered continuous or discrete. Now, continuous data can take on any value, so there is no space between data values for a given domain. Discrete data have space between possible data values. Graphs of continuous data are represented by solid lines. I mean, think about it, if there's no space between the data values, anywhere on that line can be a data value. Versus discrete data just by the dots, because there's no data in between the dots. It's just the dots. An example of continuous data, well, the number of ounces in a glass, the weight of a chocolate chip, Discrete data might be the number of glasses in a cupboard. If you think about it, you're not going to have one and a half glasses in your cupboard, unless there's a broken one, but that's not the point. You're going to have one glass or two glasses or three glasses. The number of chocolate chips in a bag, I mean, if there's 100 chocolate chips in a bag and you eat 10 of them, you, there's 90 left. You're going to have a dot for each chocolate chip. Uh, you're not going to have room in between them. You can determine if data that model real-world situations are discrete or continuous by considering whether all numbers are reasonable as part of the domain. And we have our little sticky note here to help us with that. If the domain of a function is integers, it's an example of a discrete function. I mean, if it's just one, two, three, we're not going to have the room in between. But if it's all real numbers, this is an example of a continuous function since you can have your decimals, your fractions, etc. A store sells assorted nuts for $5.95 per pound. Write a function to represent the total cost of any number of pounds of nuts. Well, we could write that saying, all right, our total cost is going to be C. And that's going to equal $5.95 per pound P. And we're going to multiply that since one pound would be one times five dollars and ninety-five cents, two pounds would be two times five dollars and ninety-five cents, and that's it for our function. Now, when it comes to filling out our function table, we're going to put our number of pounds on the left side. So one pound, two pounds, three pounds, four, five pounds, six pounds, seven pounds more, except we'll stop at five. Our function will go in the middle, $5.95 times the p's. And then our y variable here is going to be our cost. So when I have one pound, that's going to be $5.95 times that one. And that's going to result in $5.95 when I have two pounds of nuts, I'm going to have $5.95 times the two, and that is equal to $11.90 when you multiply. Three pounds is going to be $5.95 times three, which results in $17.85. Four pounds will be $5.95 times four, which is equal to $23.80. And lastly, for five pounds, we have $5.95 times the five pounds of nuts is $29.75. Our last step in this problem is to graph the function, and then answer, is the, is the function continuous or discrete, and explain. Well, our independent variable here is our 
pounds. So we're going to put that on our x-axis, pounds purchased, compared to our dependent variable, the total cost depends on the pounds you purchase, so total cost is going to go on the y-axis, and that's going to be in dollars as opposed to euros or pounds or something like that. And now we get to graph our points. We'll have one pound at $5.95, and actually that's not there. <laughs> that would be closer to here, underneath, or above the one. Two pounds at $11.90 is going to be somewhere in this neck of the woods. Three pounds at $17.85 is somewhere right along here. Four and 23.80 is going to be right around here. And five with the 29.75 is going to be pretty close to the 30. And again, I made a little mistake there. Let's make sure you line things up correctly. And that's going to be there. Now, is this a continuous or discrete function? Well, in this case, we're going to have this be a continuous function. So we'll say this situation is continuous because you don't have to buy nuts in whole number increments. You can buy any amount of nuts. You can buy two and a half pounds of nuts. You can buy three and a half pounds of nuts. You don't have to just stick with the whole number poundage. In fact, it would be very difficult to buy whole number poundage. So we can draw a line through our points since this is now a continuous function. Let's continue on to our last example. And we're actually going to stop and reflect here. Explain below how a function table can be used to graph a function. Well, we had function tables before, and if you're trying to picture what that table might look like, we had our x and our y, and it gives us points for the x, like 0, 1, and 2. And you can have points for y, such as negative 1, 0, and 1. And from that, you know, we can make ordered pairs, such as 0, negative 1, 1, 0, and 2, 1. So to write this now in words, how we can describe this is we're going to make ordered pairs using the x value and its corresponding which, remember, just simply means matching y-value. Now, what do we do with that? We have our table. We wrote our ordered pairs. Well, then you would take this to a graph and graph your points. You know, 0, negative 1 would be somewhere around here, 1, 0, 2, 1. You know, so then we're going to graph the ordered 
pairs on a coordinate plane. Last, draw a line that the points suggest, especially if we have a continuous function. And so we'll sketch that line in, and that's it. Good luck.